according to the manufacturer, the Ingvit CS1 is a better scooter than the Kugu Kirin or Kukirin G2 Pro and better than the Joyor S10. This video will reveal if that is true. Last year, I ended the year with an Envy scooter, specifically the T1 model, a very powerful 6000W scooter. And as luck would have it, I'll likely end this year with an Envy scooter as well, with this test where I'll be showcasing the brand new CS1 scooter. As usual, we'll start with the unboxing, go over the specs, and at the end I'll share my opinion. Of course, I'll also tell you what it was like to ride this scooter. The Engwe CS1 comes in a double cardboard box, which means there's a plain outer thicker box and a more decorative inner box that you can put on display in stores because it looks really good. Look out, inside there's the usual impact protection, some knickknacks and various ties and covering materials need to be removed. The assembly itself is not too complicated. We are dealing with the usual stuff. We need to put on the rear yellow time and we need to put up the fire. Uh, attach the handlebar and the instrument panel. Obviously, you also need to check the brakes and see if any screws are too loose or too tight. And it's worth greasing the moving parts here and there, like the pivot points of the swing arms. The genies typically don't use much grease for this. Once you're done with this, you can start the first trial run. I promise it will be good. The Envy CS1 has some interesting features. If you look at the specifications, for example, it has a relatively large battery, at least compared to its competitors. It has a larger capacity battery. We have a 40AV 21.5AH battery, which provides over a 1000W of capacity. This is truly unique. In other words, for the same money or a bit more, we get a much larger battery capacity, which is significantly larger. It allows for a greater range test. In this respect, this scooter is definitely better than the mentioned Kukirin G2 Pro and Joyor S. 10. In what way it resembles them is that it's also a C-suspension scooter. The downside is that you can't adjust the, the height of the steering wheel. The disadvantage, although not a major one, is that the frame neck is screwed. Another downside is that the brakes are mechanical, but in this category, I think that's quite standard. Obviously, we get disc brakes, which is fine. We have one motor. It's a hub motor in the rear wheel, which is also standard. The manufacturer claims this motor is 1000 watts, but very correctly, and properly adds that this is the peak power the motor can deliver. In my opinion, the actual power is around 800 watts, based on the tests I've conducted. That's my guess. Interestingly, we get a fairly large load capacity of 200 kilograms with this scooter, although the manufacturer says we're better off if we load it under 150 kilograms. According to the factory data, the range is around 65 kilometers, and the top speed, according to the factory data, is around 55 kilometers per hour, which is achievable with the scooter. These obviously need a bit of refinement in the data, as every manufacturer measures it on a test bench. With a mass of 65 kilograms, there's no headwind, no tailwind, no red light or uphill. So it's crucial to test how far these scooters can go and at what speed under real conditions. What other capability does the manufacturer highlight? Uh, it highlights that the scooter has front and rear lights. The rear light has a built-in indicator as well. It also highlights that the display has HD resolution and comes with an NFC card so we can use NFC to access it. Unlocking and turning on the scooter. I went through this pretty quickly, so let's jump right into what it was like to use this scooter along with its flaws and good points. Uh, I'll start with the faults. There aren't many, I promise. The first one is the dashboard. Uh, in this respect, this scooter isn't any better than the Kukirin scooters. Uh, the manufacturer says this is an HD display, which means it has very fine resolution lines. The numbers and kilometer indications look really good because the moment the sun comes out, you won't see anything on this display, just like with the Kukirin. The only good thing is that at least it doesn't have touch-sensitive buttons on it, which you wouldn't be able to use if the display gets a bit wet or if the sun is shining. In this respect, it is not any better than the solutions of its competitors. Another thing I didn't like was that they left 
an incredibly long Bowden cable on the rear brake. I don't know why, but I had to coil it up eventually. It's not a big problem, just gives me a bit of a sloppy feeling. The third small thing I found is that the powder coating is a bit flawed here and there, like on the frame, for example. At the handlebar, at the clamp, where there is a, uh, a bit of a semi-closed section, the paint didn't quite get there. It stayed aluminum colored. And that's about it for the errors. In the end, I didn't encounter any other problems, so now let's move on to the good things. The first really good thing is that I really like the scooter's laughter, as well as its suspension. Of course, this damping is adjustable in stiffness. For my weight of approximately 95 to 100 kilograms, the factory setting was perfect. But if you weigh less, you'll definitely need to adjust it a bit, so you don't bounce around on the scooter. But luckily, there's no problem with adjustability. You can set it and it won't be dangerous. Can we talk for a bit uh, about one of the biggest mistakes of Kukirin rollers, which I need to address? We meet relatively often. We use a throttle. This is the handlebar wobble phenomenon in their front wheel scooters. The handlebar wobble happens because, because the Kukirin scooters have a slight design issue, which results in the wheel having no trail. But to explain what trail exactly means, I'll insert a diagram here. While you look at it, I'll explain. In short, you should always check if you extend the steering rod downward with an imaginary line, and then draw a vertical at the wheel's axis, where these two lines intersect. If it intersects below the ground surface, the scooter has no trail, but if above, it does. Why is this important? It's important because if a scooter doesn't have a trail, the wheel wants to turn backwards there is still some tendency for the wheel to turn backwards, even with a trail. But the larger the trail, the less the tendency. If the trail is negative, the wheel will constantly want to turn backwards. Here, two forces are fighting each other. We have a centripetal force from the wheel's rotation. It doesn't matter. He's always trying to force a straight run. And then there's another force, which is the tendency to turn back due to trailing. These two are fighting each other. When the steering starts to turn due to the reverse, the centripetal force pulls it back, overshoots a bit, then again this way, then that way, the flapping gets worse, and in the end you're going to crash. Then there's another problem with the suspension, especially with the C suspension. The pivot point of the swing arm is behind the wheel. You can picture it like this. We have a C. Here is where the wheel is on this part. When you load the scooter, the bottom arm of the C will bend upwards, and then the wheel and the wheel axle will move forward as well. So it can happen that when the scooter is unloaded, you have some follow through, but when it's loaded, you don't. Why is this a problem? It's a problem because when you ride a scooter on the road, you might encounter road imperfections. You might have to brake harder, or you might want to jump onto a curb. At such times, much greater load is placed on the front landing gear, and the C landing gear starts to merge. This is when we might prop it up, for instance. You hop up a small curb, the C suspension compresses, and due to this compression, the trailer sway disappears while riding. When the trailer sway stops, the wheel's tendency to turn backwards increases drastically. So, you hop up a small curb and the wheel wants to turn out of your hand, leading to the handlebar shaking and you flying off. Why did I explain this? I explained it because the Kukire scooters, especially the G4, but also the G2 and G2 Master have this issue. The first thing I checked was the situation with the Engvet CS1, and I must say it is somewhat better than the Kukire. I'm not saying it's perfect, and I'm not saying it couldn't be better, but with this scooter, the follow-up is noticeably greater than with the G2 or G3. This means that even when loaded, there's still some follow-up, and maybe even if we jump onto some curb or the front wheel hits a hole. So with the Engwet CS1, the chance of handlebar wobbling is somewhat less compared to the Kukirin scooters, which is definitely a positive. And from this point of view, this scooter is indeed better than the Kukirin yes, sir. scooters. So now we have a few points to say that this scooter is better, namely it has a bigger battery and less chance of handlebar wobbling. The third thing, which in my opinion is relatively good, is the width of the handlebars. On the Kukirin scooters, let's say the G3, we get 60 centimeters. And on the G4, if I remember correctly, it's 65 centimeters, while on this scooter, it's 70 centimeters. 
Why is this important? Again, because of the steering wobble, if the handlebar is wide, there's a larger leverage to counterbalance. And if the wobble starts, it takes less muscle strength to counteract and stop it with your hands. So this is the third point where this scooter is actually better than the Kukirin. There's one more thing I need to mention, and it's not too good. The manufacturer tried to fix the steering wobble on the Kukirin G4 by over tightening the steering bearing. The steering bearing is a bit tight when you first get the scooter. The significance of this is that the tight steering reduces the chance of the wobble starting. I experienced this issue with the CS1 as well. The steering headset is over tightened. So if you buy the scooter and start using it, it's worth looking into how to loosen the steering headset a bit to loosen it so the tightness goes away. But a positive thing about the NQVCS1 is the lights, as it has lights both in the front and back, and two strips of orange LEDs on both sides of the scooter. And we find two white position lights and two red position lights in the background. So there is absolutely no shortage of lights. And this makes a lot of sense during the day. It's not just about the design, but at dusk, twilight and in the dark, the scooter is much more noticeable for other road users. There's not a much problem with the front light either. It's a spotlight, a completely normal light. Its brightness is relatively adequate and there's no real problem with the rear light either. Although, as with other scooters, I have to mention that the footrest, more precisely the heel support, has a lamp underneath it. I don't see much point in the index as it's so low that you can't notice it from a car. And if you can't notice it, then according to index, it might as well be useless. On the bright side, I love that switch unit located on the steering. It's compact, has all the buttons you need, and I really like the turn signal switch. It finally feels a bit like riding a motorcycle. You move the switch right or left, and in the middle position, it doesn't signal either direction. And also there's a feedback beep from the instrument panel when you indicate. So you'll notice if the indicator happens to stay on. For example, these are all very good things, but of course the most important thing is what it's like to ride a scooter. And with the Engevet CS1, it was especially nice to ride. I wouldn't dare to claim that the internal structure is better than a... In the case of the Kukirin scooter, because I didn't dismantle it, but for sure, when I stand on it while riding, the comfort and user experience are much better than with the Kukirin. And I really can't explain why that is. I just feel that way for sure. It's not too heavy, not too fast, doesn't have too much torque, but somehow it feels better put together, more comfortable and more usable than, for example, the Kukiringi. I simply feel that the quality is better for some reason. It's very important to mention that this scooter has 11-inch tubeless tires. It has P10 tires. The knobs aren't huge, so it's also suitable for urban asphalt commuting. It's still suitable, but also good for light off-road. As I mentioned, the motor power is around 800 watts, as determined roughly. There's a hill behind our elbow where I usually test the scooters. The 2000W scooter made it up. The 1200W Kukinin G3 struggled, but made it up as well. But the 800W G2 couldn't make it up. And the OOTD S10, which is said to be 1200W, didn't make it up either. The Engved CS1 could go up this incline just as far as the Kukinin G3. The, um, looking at the specs of the OOTD S10, I'm guessing this scooter has an 800 watt motor. I say this because with Kukirin scooters, for example, they don't usually cheat on motor power. So when it says 800 watts, it really means 800 watts. The 1200 watts claimed for the OTD S10, on the other hand, is doubtful. So what can I say in conclusion about the Engbet CS1? In my opinion, among the mid-range scooters I tested this year, it was the best at the bottom of the category. And what should you understand by this? Well, I've had the Kukirin G3 this year, I had the Kukirin G2, and I had the Kukirin G3. The OOTD S10, these three scooters, and now the Eggvet CS1, form a roughly similar category of scooters. If I had to choose which one to buy, I would. Without a second thought, I would choose the Engevet CS1. Even though the 
EGVET CS1 is a bit more expensive than the mentioned scooters, it definitely feels like you're getting a much better quality. Based on the specs, you also get a bigger battery and a longer range. I haven't mentioned yet, and of course it's very important, that under my weight, this claimed 65 km range is nowhere near accurate. I estimate it to be around 40 kilometers with normal riding, and if you're around 100 kilos like me, you should expect a range of less than 40 kilometers. The top speed wasn't the 55 kilometers per hour that the manufacturer promises, but that's because I don't weigh 65 kilograms. For me, it was more like 45 to 47 kilometers per hour that the scooter could reach on a straight path. And then, We've now reached the point where I think I've said everything worth saying about what it's like to ride the scooter, the specs. I talked a bit about the weakness of the seat suspension, and that's it. This scooter review pretty much wraps up my scooter reviews for the year. If not, and I was wrong, then I apologize. In any case, if you like this test, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment because YouTube's algorithm likes that. As usual, You'll find the link for purchasing below the video on YouTube, and I'll also provide a coupon code to get it slightly cheaper than the store price. Thank you for watching this episode. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe. Take care, see you. I will be back next week, I think with this year's most exciting, most interesting test. So come back, bye.